Uh, all right. I am going to introduce today's speakers. I'm Janelle Hare. I am the lead faculty for Moorhead State University. And we have two people from my department, yay, today. We have first Dr. Emma Schmitzihi, who is a chemist. She obtained her chemistry degrees at the Missouri University of Science and Technology. And as you can see, she's going to be talking about um, research and development in a cure course in chemistry. Uh, Dr. Schmitzihi has been at Moorhead State for, I think, two years now and into her third. Is that right? It's actually, I, I've i been here three years and I'm starting kind Dang of in it. the fourth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Man, time flies. <laughs> yeah. So I will uh, let you take it away. I can see your slides up already, Emma, and go ahead and uh, be happy to hear what you have going on in chemistry. Okay. Okay, great. I assume you guys can hear me okay? Yes? Yep. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about um, my current progress developing a cure course in for our chemistry program. Um, and so I've been looking into trying to apply for, you know, grant funding to help support a cure course. Um, and so that's, that's why actually it prompted to... Uh, to actually give a presentation here because I was looking into possibly submitting to Kentucky Embry for a cure grant. Um, so um, just a general introduction. I assume most people know what a cure course is, but it's basically combining, you know, what we typically think of a course, uh, you know, the education we're trying to provide the students with research, which typically is something separate and sometimes optional for the students. Um, and so that gives us our cure course or our course-based undergraduate research experience. And so I'm working on developing a course specifically for chemistry research, um, but hopefully biologically relevant enough um, that it interests enough of our students to participate and engage in it. Um, so our target students for this course, really um, the target is planned to be for lower level students. And so um, it, the, the idea is that the students will only need to have that first chemistry lab. OK, so once they get through their first chemistry lab, they'd be eligible to enroll in this. And we actually would want them to enroll, you know, either the semester after that or within a year, hopefully. Um, and so um, and another idea is the plan is to try to make it required for chem majors. We're actually looking at changing some of our requirements um, and especially since gen ed changed uh, with some you know, the required capstone and stuff isn't gen ed anymore for us at MSU. Um, we're looking at actually developing this course as a required course for the chem majors, um, but open to other majors. And so I guess I should mention that really what I'm wanting to develop is a purely cure course. So not integrating the research into an already uh, developed course. So not like into a gen chem lab or into an organic lab. The idea is to create, you know, a lower level kind of introductory course to research. And so um, it would still include, you know, educational components kind of training them how to do research, but it would be really all focused on, you know, something standalone from a typical course. So it could be flexible to some semesters go more in the analytical direction, some semesters go more in an organic direction, um, or, you know, have mixes of those things. And so that gives us a lot of flexibility. I'm not tied to a particular course and we have to get through certain content. Um, it's just more geared towards actually getting the students started in research as soon as possible. Um, and so I want to train the students early. And it's really important, especially in chemistry. I'm sure other <laughs> departments have this issue, too, where some faculty, when students come and ask about research in their freshman year, they're like, well, you need to get through this course first. You know, and so 
a lot, a lot of times in chemistry that tends to be the case, faculty don't want to take on students that you know, after their first semester in chemistry, because they don't have enough foundational knowledge, you know, they don't have the skills. Um, but the problem is, is if we put them off too far, they tend to, you know, just not even make it that far and maybe even give up. And so um, we want to get them in early, but that will also help to increase how many semesters potentially that they are doing research. Because now a lot of students wait until like their junior or senior year and they might get, if they're, you know, if they really get in, start a junior year, maybe they get two years of research and that's great. But most, honestly, I see do one semester of research or maybe two. And they get into one project and barely get their toes in, you know, but this way, if we get them in early, then they get a lot more experience, they really can kind of tweak their skills. Um, and it actually allows them enough time if they really get in freshman year or start of sophomore year that they can actually jump to different projects. So if they wait till their senior year, they kind of have to pick an advisor and go and do research with them and hope they like it. But this way, if they start research, say with me, and then they're like, well, I don't love this stuff. And then maybe they talk to another chemistry faculty or a bio faculty and realize, oh, maybe I'm actually interested in something else. And then they still have plenty of time to move and try some other things. And that way they can start to better understand where they wanna go with their degree. Um, so, I've got some major goals for this course. The first is, of course, to teach the students important research skills. So I've got some basic things, you know, like how to find and use literature, because a lot of the students are lost when we tell them to go find journal articles. They act like they have no clue even where to find them. And also, maybe they go find them, but they only read the abstract. <laughs> they don't really dig into it or they don't know how to use it. And so part of this will be some of the time spent on actually training them, you know, how to go find it and how to find good, you know, stuff, how to really search properly, uh, and then how to really extract useful information out of it. Um, and then also just proper methods for important lab techniques. Like one thing in chemistry is just being able to prepare a solution properly, you know, really get the right concentration. You know, some students go through 111 lab and 112 lab and, and they're still totally lost. They act like they've never made a solution in their life. <laughs> and so, you know, in this, it, it would be a little more focused and not just intertwined in a lab where in regular labs, their goal is to just finish the lab, get the grade. <laughs> and so in this, we can kind of slow them down and make them realize the importance isn't just getting this one lab done so you can get the lab report done. It's really learning that skill. Um, and then also another big part that of the teaching for this course is um, the plan is to have them use several of our larger instruments um, that typically, if they use them in labs throughout their degree, they usually, it's like a black box. You go in, you put the sample in, and someone tells you what button to push, and magically they get stuff, and you tell them what to do with it. And so it's getting rid of that part of it and trying to teach them, okay, what can you change? What can this instrument do different than just what you used it for in a general lab? Um, and so there'll be kind of a training component of this, um, but also another goal is to really just get them engaged in research. And well, that's the big goal of a cure course, any cure course. Um, but I really wanna make sure that they start learning how to really develop the questions to really realize, okay, what do we want to research? Uh, and understand then if there's something they're interested in and they're questioning and they say, well, it seems like this is a problem we need to figure out, then they also, you know, will be expected to engage in trying to come up with how would we test that, you know, develop the experiments. Uh, but then also once they do that, before even performing them, you know, another component would be them doing a risk assessment, like any risks of the chemicals, the waste, um, safety, you know, of the equipment they need to use and things like that. Um, 
Also, then once they get their results, there'll be a big expectation on actually being able to interpret them, not just, you know, like in a typical lab, they write up a report and they're supposed to write conclusions and you may get these very vague, you know, things went well um, or it didn't go well. You know, the results weren't as expected. You know, this will be a lot more really pushing them to understand what that means to interpret the results and actually really engaging and thinking about, okay, what do we do from here? And depending on where in the semester we are, some of that will be them actually planning, where do we go from here? What's our next step? Um, and so those are kind of two, two of the big goals is to first teach them, you know, kind of the skills they need because they're going to be coming in after their first lab. So they've worked with a little bit of equipment, but they probably really didn't, you know, get, oh, sorry, my light, um, they probably didn't get, you know, all of those skills settled in, you know, they didn't get enough practice, they didn't retain it. Um, and so we want to kind of reiterate or make sure they know some important things and then get them to apply it to something that actually, you know, is important. Um, but then one other big picture goal for this is um, to increase our retention in chemistry. Honestly, I think even before COVID, things were going down a little bit, um, at least in our department. But COVID has really just killed us <laughs> for chemistry students. And I think a lot of the students seem less engaged um, and they're less confident in themselves. And so um, the problem with chemistry with that is they come into Gen Chem and it's not an easy class and they get overwhelmed very quickly. Um, and sometimes you get lucky in lab, you get lots of interaction with the students and sometimes you'll get enough to identify the students who are getting overwhelmed and be able to help them. But it still can be pretty busy in a regular lab because you gotta get through this specific stuff. So in this course, another big goal is to improve the actual communication between the chemistry faculty and the students. And that would be not only like me, I would be the lead on this course, at least to start, but other faculty are gonna be engaged. And so we're going to increase how much interaction they're actually getting, which then the students start feeling more comfortable. They realize we're not as scary as they think. Um, also, just to increase their confidence, because the more you interact with them, the more they realize, OK, I actually am not as bad off as I think, because sometimes they get so overwhelmed and it ends up being the tiniest misunderstanding. And once they actually talk to you, you know, you work that out. Um, another thing is just getting them engaged. Once they start getting engaged in these projects, then they start realizing, oh, maybe actually I never thought of that. Maybe I do want to go into this field. Or I thought I was interested in that. It sounded interesting when you told me about it. And now that we've done it, I don't want to do that with my life. And so giving them some direction and the sooner you can get them in there to do some hands-on stuff and really communicate, the, the sooner they actually start figuring out their direction or realize that they need to start looking for what they're actually interested in. Um, so that's kind of a general idea of the main goals for this. Now, the structure... I don't have everything outlined perfectly. Um, I've went back and forth with lots of little ideas. Um, so instead of looking at nitty gritty little things, uh, the big picture of it is there's going to be a training component. And I want to, you know, spend enough time that they get a good foundational knowledge, that they get enough time to understand this is really how you do it. And here's some things you don't do. And so the plan is the first five weeks approximately to do different training things. So first, of course, you have to explain course expectations. And so think syllabus day. Um, but also that's something that I don't think it's just one day. So this list of items, it's not necessarily like week one would be talking about course expectations. It's a constant communication through those weeks as we do things, communicating, well, when you do this type of tasks, this is what's expected, things like that. Um, 
also in that first five weeks, there would be a big focus on literature. And so that looking up literature, how to use it, things like that. And then, um, like I pointed out before, a really important thing in chemistry is usually preparing solutions because to do most experiments, you need to prepare some sort of solution for that. Um, and so that would be a big part of it. But then also the research instrumentation. And so things like we have HPLC, so um, high performance liquid chromatography and then gas chromatography mass specs of the GCMS and then atomic absorption, the AA, and then nuclear magnetic resonance um, or NMR, and then doing UV vis spectroscopy. So those are just some big ones. Um, and I think it, it would differ semester by semester depending on kind of what projects get put in and out of the course, but we really want to get them experience on the bigger equipment that you don't really get as much in your courses. And like I said before, when we use that stuff in our other courses, usually it's a cookie cutter experiment. They come in, they have directions, they put the sample in and magically they get what they're supposed to get. And so we're trying to take that away and show them more of the reality of it and show them that you can actually change things and get different information from these instruments. Um, and so there'll be kind of a training portion of that. And so that part, I already have a lot of stuff developed to try to do like training experiments on those. So things that we would have known, you know, results, but to show them how you would set it up and what things you could change. Um, but then, of course, we'd get to what you really think of as the cure course, the actual research, the final about 10 weeks. Um, and so in that, I have some major categories of things that that I would plan to do. And um, it's just common things that are foundational things that you would need to know how to do in chemistry research so that um, hopefully if they apply this in this course and start learning how to do those things when they continue, they can move it to a higher level and apply it to other things. So um, things like preparing standards and calibration curves. So a lot of things um, in chemistry, we quantify things. And so they've got to, to do that. Um, so they've got to be able to prepare the solutions that would actually give them the information to compare to an unknown. Uh, also getting into the reality of things and not you know, our typical labs, they come in and they have these nice samples we give them because we prepared them straight from a pure sample. Um, and so we'll be looking at actual real world sampling and um, preparation of those samples. So think like if you get soil samples and you're wanting to analyze these soil samples, well, you got to figure out based on what you want to analyze in there, you got to extract that stuff and get rid of the rest of the crud. And so that's the that's some stuff that they don't do much of in a regular lab. In the upper level ones, yes, but not in the lower level. Um, and as I said, you know, quantifying things, also identifying things, the quantification and identification, that stuff is all really linked to the instrumentation. Uh, and that's stuff that we do a basic level of it in our regular uh, courses, but um, applying this to actual research topics, you know, of interest um, will show them a little more about what you can do with it, how you can expand on it. Um, also, we'll dive into actually looking at the stability of different samples, because if you're trying to assess these things, you need to make sure that when you've had to store them for a while, that what your results are now actually are the reality of what you wanted to be studying. You know, it didn't degrade or um, if things are degrading, you know, being able to understand, okay, well, this kind of sample degrades and what does it degrade into? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and then um, several of the, really the topics now that I plan to focus on the first time around, um, at least the first time around, is a lot of, um, I want to say like, not pollutant problems, a lot of contamination issues or, you know, byproducts of things that are bad, <laughs> um, that are health issues. So a lot of health issue chemicals. Um, and so they would not only be looking at how do we identify, you know, where are these um, 
chemicals, you know, so what types of substances cause these risks for our health and, but also thinking about, okay, so if this is a risk and say the FDA says the safe level is a certain amount and we know there's more of that in some samples and we say, okay, well, how do we fix that? And so the students starting to try to think about how could you go about say extracting that chemical you know to where then the remainder of stuff could still be used and so um all of these little things would be pieced together in these topics and it would be a big team effort where the students for you know a couple of weeks might look at sample preparation of different things and then a couple of weeks they start looking at quantifying things in there and you know and so they would be stepping through but it'd be a big team effort to where some people might work on one instrument for a particular uh, project and then others would work on other instruments and then they'd come together put the data together and think about okay next step based on what we've learned what can we do now or how do we study the next thing uh, and so in this uh, kind of the planned research topics at least for initial rounds like I said um, really it's I, I'm trying to focus things on biologically interesting things because most of our students here, you know, they're either, you know, actually biology majors or pre-med um, or the chemists or they tend to all want to do something medically related. And so I'm looking for biological interesting, you know, topics. And so one thing, the one that I've done the most kind of foundational work on is studying e-liquids. And so that's something that you know, several years back was really big issue with people having lung issues and stuff. And the question of the safety of the, the stuff in there, the levels of things, the byproducts of things in the e-liquids. And so we've been looking at some foundational experiments of quantifying things first off. And so that's one of the, the things that is already set up to be a training procedure on how to use the instruments. And then that's potentially something that then the students can think about, okay, what aspect of this do we want to look at further and start developing experiments on how can we look at this further? Um, another big hot topic now with, you know, dangerous chemicals is PFAs. Um, and so a lot of polyfluoro um, alkyl compounds are contaminants in water and in soil um, from just things that have been, been produced in the past and thought they weren't an issue. And so that's another thing the students could be looking into. And so um, another one, it's a big hot topic now, FDA is looking into the levels of heavy metals in foods. They already have regulations, but right now they actually are planning to lower the acceptable levels of things in baby foods because they realize, well, babies and elderly people, you know, the higher levels of you know, the heavy metals, we might be able to handle you know, just if you're not, you know, a baby or, or an elderly person, but, you know, they're looking a little closer first at infant food, you know, to see what are the current levels that we're accepting and what is kind of out there and what should we have it at. And so regulations are supposed to be changing, meaning that companies need to be able to accurately test it and they need to figure out how can we lower this. So we need to assess like, are there locations that you're, you're getting more heavy metals from where you're growing the foods, things like that. And so the students can start exploring into that. Um, and then also another one, that I've run across recently is there's question of the plastics in detergent pods. And so uh, the, the PFA and it, it um, or PVA, I'm sorry, polyvinyl, uh, oh gosh. Um, so it's a polymer, this plastic, it breaks down some. And in the wastewater treatment, it breaks down a little bit, but there's enough left over that it's a health concern. And so then, you know, we can look at quantifying it and seeing is there a way we can extract more or there are methods that extract it better. So um, those are just my initial thoughts on topics that could be in the first semester. And I know it looks like, okay, well, you got a lot of topics, should you focus? But I also have to consider 
if we want to use these bigger instruments, um, all the students can't be on an instrument at one time. And if we have, say, a class of 20, because it's really meant to be a lab class, um, then I, I have to have several kind of things happening at once. And so some students one week might be looking at e-liquids on the HPLC and some other students might be looking at heavy metals and foods on the AA. And so it's gonna be something that, you know, we have to get creative with rotating kind of what people are working at at a given time. Um, uh, Emma, we've got yeah. about three minutes. Okay. I know I'm a, time just flies just when you're having done. fun. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, the last major thing is student assessment, okay? And so how, how you know, what would the expectations be? Where are they getting their grade, you know? Um, and one big thing is they'd be expected to keep a lab notebook and keep track and do it properly like you would be expected to in a research lab. Um, and that would be something that would be spot checked weekly, just, you know, glancing at things and giving them suggestions, don't do this, do that. Um, and then at the end, they would need to turn that in for a final assessment. Um, they'll also be expected to do presentations. The plan is to do like a bi-weekly. And so if it's a three-hour uh, class for like a lab class, then say an hour of that might be little short presentations. Um, and so in that is just them kind of communicating to the whole class what they found on their kind of part of the project in the past couple of weeks. Um, but with that, that's a part where um, I've talked to other chemistry faculty and they're really excited about engaging in this. None of them want to take the lead, but they're like, I'll participate. And so one of my big plans with that is to bring in the other chemistry faculty, like they could each once a month come in or something um, and watch these presentations. And I had even thought I might not even be there because I don't want the students to think that I'm going to answer their questions. And also they need to know how to communicate to people who don't know what they're talking about. And so the other faculty wouldn't be engaged in the experiments. And then they'd come in and the students need to fully explain it. So it's kind of good test for them to actually be able to explain what they're doing. Um, and then in the end, by the end of the semester, they would be expected to put a poster together. And that we'd have a small little poster session with chemistry faculty and if any other faculty wanted to go, but also then I would encourage them <laughs> to then present that at whatever is upcoming, depending on what semester it is, at our school celebration of uh, student scholarship or the KAS, but that wouldn't be part of their actual grade. Okay. Um, Emma? But the poster internally would. Okay, yeah. so am I out of time? Yeah, I wanted to see if anybody had questions. That's that, fine. Yeah. That they wanted to ask. Because yeah, I've, really, got, I've got one, I've got like several, okay. but um, I, I guess, is there any role in this in the curriculum for what kind of credit they would get, what credit this would count for? Well, at the moment, so what I'm looking into is if there's a way. Um, when we make some changes, because like the 499, there's discussion since it's not gen ed for us anymore, uh, to see if we could move like a credit hour to make this course a requirement instead of three hours of 499 or something else. We got to look deeper. So I'm planning in a few weeks a meeting with the chemistry faculty to discuss um, would there be benefit to make this required? And how could we do that without increasing our total credit hours? Because mm -hmm. we know we can't do that. So is there somewhere we could shift it? Because mm -hmm. okay. with the discussions I've had, everyone feels like it would be beneficial to pull the students in early. Because like I said before, we have an issue in chemistry right now. We have really lost a lot of students, you know, especially since COVID. And we got to find a way to keep, you know, get them engaged early and not scare them off just because of the lecture courses. And so the the idea is to try to make it a planned, uh, required in it, like a research hour, you know, but like at a 199 level or something. Hmm. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Now, the only thing I know is the more I dig into this, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if it'll, it'll work to go to Kentucky Embry Cure, just because I don't know how biomedical 
<laughs> I can mm. really make the research. I, I don't know if it would be considered biomedical enough. It might be too chemistry. <laughs> no, maybe we can have some discussions and, and we can talk to in yeah. leadership and, and see what they think. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have a okay. speaker today who is Dr. Melissa Mefford. She is a biologist in the same department as biology and chemistry. And she works on telomeres in yeast. And she's got a bunch of great stuff to tell us. So I will um, let her take over. I can see your stuff, Melissa. I had to unmute myself. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to tell you today about uh, two projects going on in uh, the Mefford lab. So in the Mefford lab, we are interested in chromosome structure. So you are probably aware that in prokaryotes and archaea, they generally have a single circular chromosome with no ends, whereas in eukaryotes, they generally have multiple linear chromosomes. These linear chromosomes have very specialized regions at the ends called telomeres. And telomeres uh, are important, but also kind of problematic for the cell to deal with. <clears throat> so just to explain what telomeres are, uh, they are repeated DNA sequences that are bound by a complex of proteins. And together, the DNA and the proteins provide caps that protect the ends of the chromosomes. So these telomere caps are important to prevent degradation by nucleases, which could chew up the DNA. It also prevents the telomeres from being recognized as double-strand DNA breaks, which are bad for a cell, and a cell would try to repair those. If there is re recognition of telomeres as double-strand breaks, it causes fusion of chromosomes, which results in dicentric chromosomes. Those dicentric chromosomes lead to massive genome instability, which is a major hallmark of cancer. So if there are any issues with uh, the capping of the telomeres, the cells are really going to be in trouble. The other thing that is challenging about telomeres is that these ends of the chromosomes can't be fully copied by the DNA replication machinery. So this results in a problem that we refer to as the end replication problem. So if we look at a telomere end here, um, the strands will be separated and each will be used as a template to generate a new daughter strand in gray. So for the leading strand synthesis, this is done in a continuous fashion, and there are no issues fully copying the new daughter strand. However, on the lagging strand, the new strand has to be synthesized discontinuously, which requires multiple RNA primers shown in magenta. And those RNA primers have to be degraded and replaced with DNA. However, at the very end of the telomere, there is no primer for the DNA replication machinery to get started with. So it results in a daughter strand that is shorter than the template strand. And if there were no way to get around this end replication problem, then telomeres would gradually shorten uh, with each round of replication, and eventually you would begin to lose important genetic information. So to get around the end replication problem, most eukaryotic organisms require an enzyme complex called telomerase. And telomerase is minimally composed of a telomerase RNA molecule, which provides the template to specify the DNA repeats to be added, as well as an protein enzyme TERT or telomerase reverse transcriptase, which is going to catalyze the addition of nucleotides onto the original three prime end that lengthens that strand so that now the canonical DNA replication machinery can come in, lay down another RNA primer, uh, and fill in what would have been that missing information. So uh, in my lab, we have two projects going on, which are currently funded by an NIH R15 grant. So one aim of the project is asking a very broad question, which is telomeres create the end replication problem. If they're uncapped, it's a bad thing for the cell. Uh, so it seems like it's very challenging. So why did linear chromosomes and tel uh, telomeres evolve? And in this project, we're 
uh, as I'll explain, going to be trying to circularize linear chromosomes to see uh, if there is any benefit to the linear versus circular architecture in eukaryotes. And then the second question is focused on the telomerase enzyme and specifically the telomerase RNA. So the function of the RNA is uh, not well uh, understood. So we have a project uh, doing a genetic screen to try to identify mutations that will help us to better understand the function of the telomerase RNA. <laughs> so all of these projects are done in my favorite model organism, budding yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So just to remind everyone about some key features of budding yeast, they are single-celled eukaryotes. They have 16 linear chromosomes. They can exist in a haploid or diploid state. They can undergo both asexual and sexual reproduction life cycles. Whoops. Uh, they have a sequenced and very well annotated genome, including in the telomere and subtelomeric regions, which is important for our project. They are also very easily genetically manipulated, so they have naturally high rates of DNA recombination, so we can rely on homology uh, directed repair to integrate uh, DNA anywhere in the genome, and there are also lots of genetic markers that we can use. And then finally, they are relatively cheap, quick, quick, and easy to grow, which is good when you're working with undergrads. So, for our first aim, asking again, why did linear chromosomes and telomeres evolve? And can eukaryotes survive with circular chromosomes? Uh, there is some precedent uh, in the literature that exists that suggests that yeast can survive with circularized versions of their chromosomes. So just to briefly go through some of the, well, the only data, there are only uh, three uh, incidents that I am aware of. Uh, back in the early 80s, uh, scientists were doing an EMS mutagenesis study, and they discovered a ring derivative version of chromosome 3. Uh, for any yeast aficionados out there, chromosome 3 has two similar mating type loci uh, in the left and right arms of the chromosome, so it was a random recombination event between those two regions. Uh, it did result in the loss of non-essential genes, so um, it was not uh, a, a clean uh, circularization. Uh, more recently, a group took all of the 16 chromosomes in budding yeast and linked them into one really long, what I call mega chromosome. And then they took the ends of those chromosomes and joined them together to form a single circular chromosome in yeast. And that was viable. And then in a different yeast, the fission yeast Schizosaccharomyces pombi, uh, there was a, a study where they deleted some of the telomere capping proteins. The cells uh, underwent the crisis of telomere shortening. And since Pombi only has three chromosomes, they found some rare survivors uh, that were able to survive by circularizing their three chromosomes. So these studies all suggest that eukaryotes can survive uh, reasonably well with one or more uh, circular chromosomes. But in all of these studies, there were other things going on, so uh, decapping the telomeres and the crisis of senescence. So the approach that we are taking is going to aim to circularize chromosomes in the most natural setting we can do so, so that there aren't other changes that occurred besides the circularization of the chromosome. So in order to do this, we have developed a genetic engineering strategy to circularize the yeast chromosomes. This is a three-step process. So in the first step, we have to generate two DNA cassettes, and we are ultimately gonna insert these into the left arm and the right arm of a single chromosome. These cassettes uh, contain several important elements. They each have a unique selectable marker. So HIS3 for the left arm cassette and LU2 for the right arm cassette. This will allow us to select for the integration event when these get integrated into the chromosome. They also contain a half of a second selectable marker called the URA3 marker. So these halves won't be functional when they're located at opposite ends of the chromosome, but there's a region of homology indicated by the striped lines that will be important in our final step of circularization. 
And then the gray at the ends of the chromosomes contains homology to the particular left arm or right arm region of the chromosome where we want to integrate these cassettes. So once we build these cassettes by PCR, then we transform that DNA into a yeast strain and we select for the integration of these cassettes again into the left arm and the right arm. And we can select for these double integrants on media lacking histidine and leucine. Once we've obtained a double integrant, then the final step is to allow DNA recombination to occur between the homology and the two halves of the URA3 marker gene. This recombination event will reconstitute a functional version of the URA3 gene, uh, as well as loss of the telomere and distal selectable markers. So we can select for uh, the yeast where the circularization event has occurred uh, by selecting for growth on media lacking uracil. So I have made this sound hopefully quite elegant and simple. Uh, it took us about a year and a half, two years to get the cassettes designed correctly uh, and to obtain our first circular chromosome. Uh, but spoiler alert, we've got it working quite efficiently now. So to date, we have successfully circularized six of the 16 chromosomes, which are the ones shaded in the, the darker colors on this figure. Um, and of note, we have successfully circularized both the smallest chromosome, chromosome one, as well as the longest chromosome, chromosome four. So I'll take you through a little bit of the data, just showing a represent, representative example of what this data looks like. Uh, so our circular chromosomes are growing as we expect on our selectable marker. So I have a cartoon of our wild type strain, which has deletions for its endogenous copies of those uh, selectable marker genes. Um, and in the growth, we have growth of the wild type strain, the double integrant strain is in the middle, and the circular chromosome strain is on the bottom left. So if we look at the growth on rich media in the bottom left here, YPDA, all of the strains grow fine on rich media. If we look at the dropout media, so minus his and minus lu, we find only the double integrant strains are able to grow on those medias as expected. And if we look at the minus uracil media on the right, only the circular chromosome strain is able to grow on minus ura as expected. That circular strain also loses the ability to grow on minus lu and minus his, which is what we would expect if the circularization event uh, occurred as we think. So in addition to the growth data, we also use PCR to uh, confirm that we have a, achieved circularization as we think. So we have uh, multiple sets of PCR primers, and we look at uh, these pairs of PCR primers on uh, the wild type parental strain. So we have a set of control primers, which uh, we only see a product or that's the only product we see in our wild type strain. It's to an internal random genomic locus. Uh, we also have pairs of PCR primers that are within the left and right cassettes, as well as spanning the junction of where those cassettes should be integrated. And we only see these products in our double integrant strains. So this tells us uh, that the cassettes are present in these strains and also that they are located within the left and right arms of the chromosome that we designed them to. And then we also have a, a final pair of primers uh, that either amplify the ura gene, which tells us the ura gene is present somewhere, as well as a pair of primers that spans the new circular junction, which we would only get a product for if those two uh, ends of the chromosome have been uh, joined together. So the product uh, boxed in red on the bottom uh, shows that for this chromosome, chromosome four, we did in fact detect a, a circular junction product by PCR. Uh, and as expected, we lose the ability to detect the left cassette and right cassette products because those regions got uh, chopped off during the recombination event. So now that we've got these circular chromosomes, our next step in the plan is to begin to characterize these circularized um, chromosomes. So do they have any differences relative to wild type? So again, spoiler alert, but we are not finding that there are any major differences between the circular strains and the wild type strains. 
So we've been looking at doubling time in liquid culture. So again, this is an example from chromosome four. Uh, the circular strain doesn't seem to have any major differences in its doubling time. Uh, if we look at colony size and morphology, again, the circular strains don't seem to have any uh, noticeable differences. We've also tried to stress the cells with different temperatures, and we don't see any differences between our circular strains and wild type at either high or low temperatures. And we've also looked at these yeast cells under a light microscope to look at cell size and shape, as well as their budding patterns. Uh, and again, we don't see any major differences. The average cell area is quantitated at the bottom for wild type and circular chromosome four. So we are uh, in the process right now of trying to uh, repeat a few of those uh, phenotype tests, as well as to get pretty looking PCR gels and, and all that kind of good stuff uh, to publish this story. Uh, so uh, this data is important because it shows that our genetic engineering approach works, uh, that we have successfully circularized six of the 16 chromosomes, and that of those circularized chromosomes, we haven't observed any phenotypic differences with the few tests that we've tried thus far. Uh, we do have lots of future directions with this project. So uh, one thing that I am very um, keen to try to get working is to find a physical method that would allow us to more directly uh, visualize that we have circularized chromosomes. So the two approaches that we are considering at this time are pulse field gel electrophoresis, which can separate large pieces of DNA, including the yeast chromosomes, um, or taking a microscopy-based approach. Um, so we're still um, looking into to those. Um, and then we wanna further characterize the circular strains. There are lots of different uh, assays we could try to do. Uh, there are some companies that make yeast phenotype arrays that have about 400 different drugs and salts and uh, conditions that we could uh, use uh, to easily test a large number of different uh, conditions. I'm also uh, keen to do an RNA-seq experiment to see if there are any changes in gene expression when we circularize the chromosome, uh, particularly because the arrangement of chromosomes within the nucleus um, is, is thought to be important. And when we get rid of the telomeres, we may be disrupting the organization of the, the nucleus. And then the other thing we're excited to test is mating and sporulation. So sporulation is meiosis in yeast. And from those previous studies that I mentioned, um, they did find that those circular chromosome strains that they had looked at had decreased sporulation efficiency. So um, I think uh, what that's telling us is that linear chromosomes are probably important for uh, sexual reproduction and meiosis. So um, again, curious to see if our circular strains will have similar defects in sporulation, and then can we try to figure out why circular chromosomes are, are not good at, at undergoing meiosis. And then, of course, we've got 10 chromosomes that we have not yet circularized, so uh, we, we also hope to get those circularized as well. Okay, so switching gears uh, to the second aim in the Mefford lab, and again, this is focused more on trying to understand the structure and function of the telomerase RNA component, so part of the enzyme. And telomerase RNAs are really fascinating because they are very rapidly evolving. So if you look at telomerase RNAs from different species, they vary dramatically in length. So there are about 150 nucleotides and ciliates up to over 2KB in some species of yeast. They vary in their sequences such that you cannot align uh, these uh, genes. They're just too different. Uh, and they also, uh, have quite a bit of variety in their uh, predicted structures. So here, again, I'm showing the secondary structure predictions for uh, three of these telomerase RNAs. And as I've said, the, the structure and function of telomerase RNAs is actually not well understood. Uh, what we do know tends to come from loss of function studies. So you get rid of a part of the RNA and the enzyme doesn't work anymore. Um, so 
one of the motivations for the types of mutations that uh, my lab has gone after is that it turns out that budding yeast telomerase actually has relatively poor activity in vitro. So I'm showing uh, some in vitro telomerase activity assays. Uh, the yeast telomerase in vitro can add up to seven nucleotides, but it pauses and gets stuck along the way. So it can barely add a single repeat in vitro. But if you compare that activity to human telomerase, human telomerase uh, rarely pauses uh, during the addition of a, a six nucleotide repeat. And you see that it adds repeat after repeat after repeat running up the gel. So um, as I said, most of what we know about telomerase RNA function has co come from looking at loss of function mutations. Uh, but in my lab, we've decided to look at the, the opposite flip side of the coin, if you will. So we have designed a genetic screen that aims to identify gain of function mutations in the yeast telomerase RNA, which would presumably be improving the activity of this uh, not so great uh, enzyme. <clears throat> so I'll briefly go through what our uh, screening strategy has been. So the first thing we did was create a library of mutations in a telomerase RNA gene using error-prone PCR. We estimate that we generated about 5,000 unique mutations in our library. We then transformed that library into a strain of yeast where the uh, mutant version is the only version of telomerase RNA in the strain. We then had to uh, replica plate the yeast for multiple generations in order to allow the telomerase RNA mutant that was in there to either shorten or lengthen the telomeres. Um, so here I'm, I've boxed the change in telomere length. Um, once we've given the uh, yeast time to, to change their telomere length, then we use a phenomenon called the telomere position effect to select for strains that have longer telomeres. So uh, the telomere position effect uh, relies on the fact that telomeres are generally silenced, and I'm showing silencing proteins as yellow circles in this diagram. And when you have short telomeres, there's less space for the silencing proteins to begin to seed and then spread throughout the telomeric region. So genes closer to shorter telomeres are expressed at a higher rate. However, when you have longer telomeres, there's more space for the silencing to get seeded and spread. And so you actually have decreased expression of genes located near longer telomeres. So we are using a selectable marker gene, Ura3, which is also a counter-selectable gene. So when Ura3 is silenced and not expressed, yeast are able to grow on a drug called 5-FOA, 5-fluoroerotic acid. So um, once we replica plate just to <clears throat> regular media several times, then we plate the yeast onto plates that contain the counter-selectable drug 5-FOA, and we look for colonies that are bigger than, than the ones around them. So it, I know it's difficult to see on this plate, but this is an example of one of our replica plates. And the larger colonies are the ones that we have circled. So it is a little bit difficult to see the difference in colony size on these plates. So we took any candidates that we circled and struck them to another FOA plate. Um, if they grew well um, and better than our controls <clears throat> on that plate, then we rescued the plasmid that contained our library from the yeast. And then we sent those plasmids off for sequencing to figure out what mutations were present in our gain of function um, candidate mutations. And then to ensure that the gain of function phenotype is due to the mutation on the plasmid, not some other random mutation in the yeast strains, we then transform those rescued plasmids into fresh yeast and then repeat our gain of function assay. <clears throat> so, we screened through approximately 30,000 total yeast colonies. Uh, we had about 100, 150 um, candidates that we sequenced the plasmids from. Once we transform them into fresh yeast, at this point we have 24, what we are calling verified gain-of-function mutants. So on this uh, streaking plate here, you can see uh, the wild type 
what's labeled mini T460. That is the wild type for our library. The known gain of function mutant is a published uh, gain of function mutant. And you can see that the, the uh, candidates with the stars next to them are some of the ones that uh, we uh, re-verified. So this is a list of the mutations that are present in those 24 uh, verified gain of function mutants. You can see that we got a few single mutants <clears throat> where we know the mutation is causing the gain of function. We also got a lot of mutations that have more than one uh, mutation present, up to 10 mutations. Uh, so this is going to get complicated because uh, we need to separate which are the causative gain of function mutants from uh, any that might be neutral or even negative. Um, I don't believe we saturated our genetic screen. There are two mutations that were isolated multiple independent times, but most of the mutations we only got out of the screen once. Um, but we have 24 to work with, so I'm not sure we're going to go back and try to saturate the screen. Uh, and then uh, one thing that has been satisfying is that uh, the mutations that are bolded are mutations that were present in more than one allele. So these are at our top of our list in terms of what might be the causative mutations. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that we really need to do and that I've gotten a lot of questions about when I've presented this before at other meetings is uh, to measure the telomere lengths. So our prediction is that these mutations are causing longer telomeres, but we haven't <clears throat> actually looked at that. So uh, <clears throat> as a postdoc, I was very good at measuring telomere lengths using southern blotting with radioactive probes. Uh, we can't use radioactivity here. Uh, I have looked into a little bit of switching from a radioactive probe to a chemiluminescent type probe. Um, no one has published that, uh, to my knowledge, for telomere southern blotting in yeast. Uh, and we also don't have an imager that can handle the size of the blots uh, that I would need. So what we have done uh, instead is we found a, a telomere-based approach um, from a, a paper from the Lingner lab. So this requires a marker gene <clears throat> near a telomere. And luckily, our strain already had the same marker gene in it. Uh, so we isolate the genomic DNA. We incubate that genomic DNA with a terminal transferase in CTP. So this will add a C tail onto the three prime end of the telomere. And then we can use a, a G-rich primer, as well as a primer specific to the marker in this particular chromosome end uh, to generate a PCR product uh, that includes the telomere. So the product would be smaller if we have shorter telomeres and bigger if we have longer telomeres. So for anyone who has tried to get something to work from someone else's materials and methods, you know that it takes some troubleshooting. Uh, so uh, my undergrads have been doing an excellent job. And actually, two days ago, uh, an undergrad came to me with this gel. It's probably our 10th <laughs> troubleshooting gel. Um, but on the left here, um, this contains a, a control telomerase RNA that we know has short telomeres, and you can see where the arrow is indicating that we're getting a band, which is finally bright, <laughs> um, showing up in the, the last two lanes. The gel on the right contains wild-type telomerase, which should have longer telomeres, so we're only seeing faint products here, but they are bigger in size. So it does seem like we are getting close uh, to having this work. Hopefully a, a little bit more troubleshooting will get it working robustly for us. Uh, so our future directions with the gain of function uh, project here is that we want to now switch gears to determining the mechanism of gain of function. So how are these mutations making the enzyme work better, assuming we have longer telomeres in these uh, strains? Uh, so I could publish the results of the screen. However, I am trying to avoid that because I am concerned about getting scooped on how the mechanism of this works. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is to be able to publish uh, groups of the mutations based on what the mechanism of the gain of function is. So we have several hypotheses about how gain of function could be occurring. One hypothesis is that it is altering the RNA structure. And to test for this, we can do compensatory genetic tests. And we have designed those mutations. We just haven't made them yet. 
Another uh, possibility is that these mutations are somehow increasing the RNA abundance. And so we're interested in measuring the telomerase RNA levels using qRT-PCR. So we have ordered the things that we will need uh, to try to get that working. And then a third option that we're interested in testing is that the uh, RNA mutations might be increasing protein binding, either to TERT or the other accessory proteins that are found in the complex. And there is a uh, yeast to hybrid based assay that we uh, plan to use to, to test for interaction between RNA and, and proteins. And there are other potential mechanisms, but these are sort of the low-hanging fruits that I think our, our lab could test relatively easy. So that's where we're going first. OK, so I didn't put an overall conclusion slide, so that's it. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the, the undergrads that ha are currently uh, and previously been in my lab. They have done all of the research that I showed today. And then also thanks to KY Embry for new faculty funds and IDEA awards. Uh, and also to the NIH R15 grant, which I uh, currently have. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, this is Chuck. Uh, I enjoyed the presentations today. Even though I had my video off, I was actually here paying attention. Um, I uh, was curious, um, Melissa, just from a, as a evolutionary biologist studies relationships among species, how many species are in the survey C genus? Mm. That is a good question, and I don't know the answer. Um, quite a few. Okay. Well, is it like over a dozen or something like that? Or? I know there's at least eight. Um, and there was a recent uh, 1,001, I think, genomes or 1,100 genomes of yeast that um, were published and analyzed. I don't know how many different species versus different strains, isolates. Sure. Are in I guess there. that one species that you mentioned uh, that demonstrated uh, uh, circularization of its <laughs> chromosome, was that Pomona? Uh, it was Schizosaccharomyces pombi, and uh, pombi and cerevisiae diverged like as far back almost as humans and yeast diverged. They're very uh, distantly related evolutionarily. Okay, but it also only had what did you say three chromosomes? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'm I'm just curious about, uh, for example, you're not observing any necessarily fitness differences uh and the tests you've done so far but i'm just curious if you were to look at something um and i'm not suggesting you do that right now <laughs> but i'm just curious if you were to um look at compare something with 16 chromosomes like cervasi versus uh, the other species were just three, whether circularizing chromosomes would have a more potentially dramatic impact on some form of fitness than one that has 16 chromosomes that may be able to buffer itself uh, from any deleterious effects. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an interesting idea. I'll have to look into some of the more closely related uh, species to cerevisiae, see if there are any with, you know, differing chromosome numbers and, and what we might be able to do with that. Sure. And like I said, I'm not suggesting you go off in a different aim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, you have your hands full, it's looking good. But uh, I'm just, uh, I was just, just curious from that kind of framework. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying Thanks, to look uh, up that stuff, but <laughs> how many different species are in, are in Saccharomyces and how many different chromosomes in the eight different species? But yeah. Go ahead, Alexi. Yeah, Melissa, great talk. I, I, yeah, I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. So um, I'm also, you know, when, when you um, were talking, I was thinking about like what might be the function of top isomerases in yeast here, right? So 
like of course if there is a circular chromosome right so this top isomerases have to kind of come into play and uh, results of super coils like we know that of course for bacteria yeah. but uh, uh, eukaryotes also have top isomerases uh, I, and I I'm wondering if uh, you have some kind of some uh, ideas as to whether those top, uh, top isomerases are used more heavily uh, once you circleize uh, the chromosomes in yeast. Do you have any anything uh, of that nature that you can comment on or maybe so, some ideas? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I haven't really been thinking about it in the haploids that are growing asexually that we've used, but it, it might be interesting to delete topoisomerase genes and see exactly. if that causes a synthetic effect with the circular chromosome. Where I have been thinking about topoisomerases is I mentioned that from those previous circular chromosomes that have been published that they have defects in meiosis. Right. And so um, if our strains also have defects, which I suspect they will, I've been wondering if you could suppress those defects potentially by overexpressing topoisomerase. So could you compensate if that is the issue uh, with, with resolving the supercoiling, uh, if, if having more topoisomerase around might be able to get rid of those uh, meiotic defects. That, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also in terms of your mutations, gain of functional mutations. Uh, so I was really surprised that the Saccharomyces uh, RNA uh, is, at least it looks much different from, uh, say, human or mammal uh, yeah. RNA, right? mammalian RNA. Uh, but once you look at the mutations, can you actually see that the nucleotides that are affected by those mutations uh, may be conserved or in conserved regions if you compare mammalian RNA and uh, say this yeast RNA. Yeah, so the mammalian and yeast RNAs are so different. Uh, we can't really do that kind of comparison. Uh, we do, you are from the eight uh, Saccharomyces species, we do have a an alignment of those. I haven't gone back to see if they are in uh, conserved nucleotides. Um, the one thing is that I have, for instance, mapped the mutations onto the secondary structure model of telomerase RNA. And I was hoping that the mutations would be clustered into particular structural regions. And at this point, they seem pretty widely distributed across the whole RNA gene, uh, which is giving me uh, some concern uh, that maybe these are random mutations. The other thing that's really complicating that type of analysis at this point, though, is like we have a mutation that has 10 different nucleotides that were hit, but I suspect not all 10 of those are actually causing gain of function. So to be able to do those analyses, we sort of need to narrow down to only the causative mutations and get rid of whatever neutral kind of junk is just along for the ride. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, both Emma and Melissa, for sharing your work with us today. These will be uh, recorded and put on the KYNB website. I know that some of you have looked back at uh, other people's previous talks, so it's useful to have them compiled there. And thank you for everyone who is here listening, and I appreciate it. And uh, look on the website, I guess, to see the upcoming speakers and what their topics are. Thank you. Thank Hi, you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.